Hello, hello, and welcome to the Let's Process That podcast. I am Emily Christopher. And I am Nick Honorkamp. And we are so glad that you are here on another episode. Um, Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I was just telling Nick, um, I just had a like a little chicken quesadilla and some pretzels and peanut butter. And I was like, I kind of felt like I was eating an elementary school lunch, but it was phenomenal. I was like eating these pretzels with, I haven't had pretzels and peanut butter in forever. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Like, I don't know. It was the little things in life, you know? And yeah, the, the peanut butter the, was uh, so good. The only thing I remember from elementary school lunches was pizza and chuck wagon. You remember chuck wagon? Okay. So I don't think I've actually had a chuck wagon. Okay. Um, but my grandpa used to all, what is a chuck wagon? My grandpa always ordered them from some place in Hazelwood, North Carolina. Um, and I can't remember the name of it. Of course it's been gone forever. It was like a little diner, right. but what is a chuck wagon? I think it's some kind of processed pork. Yeah. I think it's processed pork, maybe processed hamburger with a nice crunchy layer around the outside, high carb, high calorie, high fat good soul food but they used to feed it to us as a staple in elementary school it looks so gross when i just googled chuck wagon um oh my gosh this says that it's salami bologna cured turkey that right <laughs> it is it Does listen, that sound right our northern our northern friends and especially international friends are dying right now going what is chuck wagon yeah, Google it for yourself. Wow, I didn't know like it was a multi meat conglomerate um, that was then fried. <laughs> no wonder you didn't know what it was. It was several cheap meat yeah. pulled together. Yeah, it was like um, it's like a hot dog kind of situation <laughs> yeah. where it's like I don't know what this is. Yikes! Well, that's fun. I don't know how we got to chuck wagons, but oh, so elementary school lunch. So. I posted recently, this was a few weeks ago, on my Instagram about chicken ring things. And I know yeah. they didn't have... Did they have those with when you were there? No, but but my kids did. Yes. Oh, my gosh. They were so great. And I Googled them. And you can actually buy, like, a giant frozen bag. But they were so expensive. It was, like, 50 bucks for, like, a bag of chicken ring things. And I was like, no, I will not be spending my money on that. But, yeah, Haywood County Public Schools represent, we're a product of uh, public education, and it probably shows. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, true story. We had a person in our church that was a lunch lady at the public schools, mm -hmm. and they were in charge of meals for funerals because they knew the, all the portions. So anytime we had a meal, we were like, hey, we got a meal for 60, and they're like, we need eight cans of green beans. <laughs> I mean, oh, my they gosh, exactly. that's brilliant. Isn't that brilliant? And they do all the menus. They had created three or four menus and everybody signed up to bring something on the menu. And all I had to do is call her and she would tell me how much of each portion we needed on the menu. That's great. Wow. That's what Haywood a, County, baby. That is Pastoral amazing, care. Yeah. That's an amazing resource and knowledge to have. Oh my God. Yep. Incredible. Incredible. Well, I, I congratulations are in order because- oh, really? Why? Because- Today is your first day being employed by hopefully a great boss, dare I say, yourself. <laughs> so it's, it's sad when you wake up and you realize that now you're your own boss and you're hoping that you're not the worst boss you've ever had. And what will be interesting is today's the first day that I'm self-employed. A whole other story, we'll talk about some today. But it's interesting to see whether I am still working 12-hour days because I've been the problem the whole time. Imagine that if we're our own worst problem. This is like a therapy experiment as well. <laughs> but we love therapy, so why we not? We do. We love it. Well, mm -hmm. so Nick, speaking of that, you've had a, another big life pivot change yeah. shift. So. Dare I say we go there? We process what's been going on with you. You've you've actually had quite a lot going on in this year. Like 2023, we were only three months in, just embarked on the fourth month. And like you're making some moves. You're doing some things. So that's exciting. Hey, uh, you know, I may go down in flames, but I'm going I'm gonna do it uh at uh taking risk, 
living life. Um, you know, and I didn't plan it out this way. I mean, I I don't ch- make change for change purposes. But um, one of the things that happened um, over the last six to nine months, and if you listen to some of our podcasts, you saw some of this coming. I mean, I've been leaking this a little bit. But uh, basically, after pastoring for 23 years, uh, I took a job with a large Christian nonprofit in Asheville, North Carolina, ABCCM. And my job was to go to a different church every Sunday get to know pastors and the churches and to recruit volunteers and money to serve our neighbors in crisis. We got a lot of folks who are struggling, homeless, mental health, drug addiction, all those kind of things. And so, but what's happened in the last two years is I've been in a hundred churches in 20 denominations. I have a unique view of the church world and also the nonprofit world. And we had 15 churches die in Buncombe County last year. So when you're sitting where I sit and you care about the church and you see 12 churches, I mean, 15 churches die in the last 12 months. And when you say that, just for people who may not know even that term, like that means that the church dissolved. It's no longer closed. Yeah. It's no longer functioning or up in business, basically. Yeah. So we've got churches that used to exist who no longer exist anymore. In fact, we've got some churches that the, they're trying to figure out what to do with the building because it's right next to a big old cemetery. The church had a cemetery, and now they oh, can gosh. sell the building, remodel it as an apartment, but what are the kids going to do, play in the cemetery next door? So we're seeing a real crisis in the church world and the Christian nonprofit world. And it's not that I think I'm an expert and I know so much more than anybody else, but I don't know many people that have pastored 23 years and been in 100 churches and 20 denominations in the last two years and I've got a ton of friends across the denominational lines. So in all that, I decided to start my own business of being a church consultant and a nonprofit, Christian nonprofit consultant. And I officially finished my job this weekend with uh, ABCCM. And today is my first day working for myself. And I'm putting in a 12-hour day, uh, a couple hours with you. So it's part of the yeah. whole thing. And so we had talked about... How do you know when it's time to make the big move? How do you know when it's time to make the big change? All of us need to make some big moves in our lifetime. How do you know when? So anyway, you and I thought we'd process that a little bit and see if your journey, you've made several big moves, Emily. And I thought if we would process that together, maybe we would come up with a couple clues that would help some of our listeners figure out whether or not it's time for them to make their big move. Yeah. This is definitely a reoccurring thing as well. So if you're listening for, to this podcast and you're like, oh, which we have a podcast about patterns, um, mm-hmm. this is your sign. Like, <laughs> I feel like there's going to be some people who are like, y'all keep talking about change and you keep talking. Well, okay, time to hold up the mirror and be like, what is it? What is the thing? So, yeah, yeah, definitely both of us are no stranger to change and to taking risk. I think, um, especially in the last three years, you and I both have definitely switched it up. Um, I actually posted an Instagram story a couple days ago because I got on Instagram and there was, um, it shows you your memories sometimes Mm -hmm. of like what you posted on your stories. And there was a memory of me from 2019. I'm talking to the camera and I'm sharing some stuff And Nick, I was unrecognizable. I mean, everything about me, like, oh my gosh. And I wish I could even go into detail about what was happening in that exact moment because my life was totally wrecked. I was so physically sick. Um, I had just had a treatment. Um, I, my relationship, there was something really terrible that had happened with that. And like, it is unreal. I mean, I, like I said, I'm totally flabbergasted because looking at that, I I just started to cry as I watched it because I was like, I don't know who she was. And so it just goes to show like when positive change and hard work come together, it it really is incredible. It is unreal like how different emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, like everything in my life from 2000, especially 2019 Oh my, shocking, shocking. Oh my gosh, like it's unreal. And I know we're going to talk about big life changes, but in 
recently I saw uh, a memory of you on Facebook from about three or four years ago, and I didn't recognize you physically. I didn't recognize you emotionally. And I want to tell you something. It broke my heart. I felt some level of personal responsibility that you were deeply involved in my world and you were slowly dying. You were slowly, you were in pain, you were in trauma. And it was so gradual that those really close to you didn't even see it. And now to see who you are today, your beauty, your brilliance, your how bold and brave you are, and say, wow, what, why did I not see that? Why did I not, you know, bring an intervention, call you to the house with 12 of your closest friends going, girl, something's not right. And I, you know, I apologize to you because I should have known some of those warning signs that something was going on and I missed it just being busy, whatever. But you definitely are a different person today than the memory I saw of three, four years ago. Well, first of all, no need to apologize because, and, and I think I've, brought this up before in earlier podcasts, but I hid everything so well. Mm-hmm. Well, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, now that we look back, we're like, oh my, like red flags everywhere. Like so many SOSs. True. But um, in the moment, I, I mean, I just did what I had to do. I was in survival mode and I was really good. I've always, I grew up in musical theater, so I'm a great actress. Like, if I have to put a face on, like, I know how to fake being okay, Um, which is something I will never do again because it was, again, looking back, so painful. But yeah, um, it is incredible when we finally say yes to life and a better life, what it will do. I mean, it's like I didn't even have any light in my face. Like there was no light in my eyes. Like I was just a shell of a human. And like I said, I just had to pause. And here was the here was the thing I did. So I'm I pulled up the the memory thing and that memory popped up. I actually left the room. I was with um Adrian. I left the room. I went down the hall because I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh my gosh, wow. you can't see this of me. And I wow. started to tear up and um and he had no idea this was going on. Um, started to tear up and I paused and I, I just heard a voice say, you need to love her love. Oh, I'm going to cry. Love that girl right now that you're seeing in the video. I need you to love her and show her grace. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. We're going to do that. And in that moment I was like, okay, I love you. I, I show empathy towards you. You were just doing what you, the only thing you knew how to do um, right. I don't blame you. I'm not mad at you. You were doing the best you can. And Emily, I love 2019 Emily. And I just hold a place in my heart for her. I gave space to her. And and I'm, it's crazy because I'm talking like it's another person because it really was, it feels like. But I had to give myself grace in that moment back in time. And it was really healing to have that yeah. time. And I like got up and I finally went into the back into the other room and Adrian's like, you good? And I was like, no, I just need to tell you like what happened. And <laughs> he is so gracious and so good. Um, and it was nice to be able to be honest with him too. Cause I could have easily been like, oh, nothing. Like I just stepped out, you know, blah, blah, I need water. But yeah, it was, it was interesting to go back there and forgive her and love her in that season. Uh, Cause I feel like I've, I've really been resentful of that. Um, but anyway, so there was my therapy well, for the day. <laughs> well, why were there? Why, why rush yeah. it? I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, this is important stuff. Mm-hmm. So I went through something called ultimate journey, which was a, a healing ministry that basically walk you through early childhood, your childhood, adolescence, teenage years, um, early adulthood and into adulthood. And basically, and even for like for me, I had to embrace little Nick, okay, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and get to know him at each stage. So when there was trauma in my life with little Nick, I would go back to that period of time and I would love him there. And, And the whole concept is you're an adult now. You know how to raise kids because you're now an adult. Go raise little Nick. Don't leave him there. They, there's a, a, a concept in, in psychology or in Christian in counseling called anchoring, mm-hmm. where you look like you're 30, you look like you're 30, you look like you're 30, then you act like you're seven. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And the counselor says, what happened when you were seven? You're like, a lot of stuff. And so you get stuck there. And so one of the things we learn is to go back ourselves and find our younger self and say, I'm so sorry I left you. I'm so sorry I abandoned you. I'm so sorry I was embarrassed by you and I ran away. I love you where you are. Your trauma is real. What you've experienced is real. And you deserve to be rescued. I've come to walk this out with you. So when you had that moment, I'm so proud of you for not distancing yourself from 2019, Emily, but embracing that because it's part of being coherent and being congruent and bringing yourself back together. So I'm proud of you for doing that. Thank you. And um, it was really tempting to also like delete that. And because mm. I'm the only one who will ever see it because it was a story and stories disappear right. after 24 hours. Um, right. But it was really important for me not because a lot of my <laughs> previous life has been erased off of social media. Like I'll just be very transparent and honest. Like you will not see a lot of images um, just with my former life. Like you just won't. Um, because when it was all blowing up and exploding around me, I was just like, we've got to erase this. So I did. And, um, but for me to keep that as well, because it was a really beautiful healing moment. It was a good yeah. realization. I, and I just, ever since that, I'm just overwhelmed with little moments throughout the day where I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Um, and I just, I think if I didn't have those reminders, um, that, could trigger me into a dark place, but now I'm using it as a reminder to be grateful and to reflect on my journey. So that was another thing too, is like, I didn't delete it. I kept it. And then, you know, if I need to be reminded again, it'll pop up in a year or right. whatever. Um, but yeah, it is really, it's hard to go back to painful moments. It takes a lot of courage and and I'm proud of myself too. Like, I think that's another thing is like, pausing and being proud of the decision that you made um, to change and to do something that was scary, but it's going to make you better. So I love it. And at the end of the day, um, you want to live a good life and you want to be happy mm -hmm. and to embrace a moment like that where you were not gives you an opportunity to learn from it, grow from it, and make sure it never happens again. So again, I'm proud of you for doing it apologize. I did not notice what was happening in your world. You're such an overcomer. And that's part of the problem when you have people who are resilient and strong and tough. It's that you minimize what they're going through mm -hmm. because they're so resilient. And you, you're a fighter. You, and, and, and that's, you know, who knew what you were going through, but I knew that you would survive. I just wish looking back, we could have unpacked that because some some of the, the culture we lived in, you had to hide some things. Oh, yeah. You didn't have a choice. You could not be transparent and real about some of the stuff mm -hmm. you were dealing with. Mm -hmm. So Well, and sometimes when I would try to be, it was unacceptable. Sure. Um, or I was fed some garbage <laughs> um, about how I was supposed to handle it. And so I was like, okay, I guess this is my life. Like, I need to be a good wife, and I need to just keep doing this hell. And that was what it was. So, yeah. Well, well done. Glad your memory popped up. Glad that you don't live there anymore. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard you say amen in a long time. Amen. <laughs> I like it. So, Nick... Yeah. How does it, I mean, you, you just told us day one, but what, what are the other feelings? Like we've got, I'm sure there's so many emotions and it's our last episode. We talked with how I trained them about the emotion wheel and I'm going to order one and I want to know, all right, Nick, what are the emotions that you're feeling today right now? What is, what's stirring up in you? Well, I appreciate you saying that. And I thought Tyler just did an amazing job when he yes. talked about several things. Well, let me quit avoiding the question that's the question <laughs> and i'll go back um relieved um mm. light um energetic excited um tyler talked about in his last um on our last podcast when he quit his job he says he gave up his paycheck gave up his health insurance he said you have to give up some control and but you just do what you have to you just show up and just do what you have to do do whatever it takes is what his words were. And I really appreciated that because 
I'm in a season now where I've given up paycheck, given up health insurance, given up a good job, but I'm so delighted to be betting on myself. There is nothing slowing me down, nothing holding me back. I am betting on myself. And my whole life, I've been ultra responsible, not just to people, not just to the church, not just to a community. You know what I'm talking about. I don't have to be responsible for any of that anymore. Mm -hmm. I get an opportunity to go build something, help some people, see where it goes, and and, and adjust from there. And and people are like, yeah, but you're like, you know, mid to later in your career and you're making a pretty big move. You should be working on your retirement right now, not dropping everything and starting over. But, man, I'm so excited about this journey and I'm excited about taking the big leap. And sometimes you got to walk away from stuff to embrace something else, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's always a give and take. There's always a letting go to grab something else. Um, when you say you feel lighter, what are some of the things that that make that happen for you? What is it? the responsibility of having to report to somebody? Is it the responsibility of carrying other people or having to set goals and all these like yearly quotas and stuff like this that like, is that part of the lightness? Yeah, I'm going to try to unpack this. I don't have anybody to throw underneath the bus. Nobody. I'm just yeah. trying to try to unpack a little bit. Number one, when you have a boss, then you have their expectations. You have all the stuff that they would set for you, want you to do. And many times those are things you don't want to do. Uh, and even if you do do those things, I heard a quote one time that even either you're building your dream or you're getting paid by somebody else to build their dream. And that's so true in so many different ways that your boss is paying you to build their dream. And so many times when your boss shows up, they're going to ask you to do something you don't want to do. And in this last assignment, there was plenty of things I didn't enjoy. I showed up, I did them, I did them well, but they were, some of those were very, very draining. And then on top of that, You know, you've got people that you work with. You said in your last, in our last podcast, just dealing with childhood trauma, dealing with emotional, uh, you know, EQ stuff. And so it was so good today. I didn't have any phone calls. I didn't have to deal with anybody except myself. And I'm really good about dealing with myself, even my dysfunctions. So it was felt good to not have to carry somebody else emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then third of all is, my schedule, you know, I worked 45 minutes away. So a 45 minute drive one way, 45 minute drive another way. And I thought, what would it be like when I get up in the morning and I go to the gym and I have the whole day to work on the things I think I need to work on without even leaving the house. Yeah. And so my goal was to leave the house once a day, go to the gym, do anything else I need to do, and then come home the rest of the day. And that's what I did. So I feel like 20 pounds lighter emotionally. I'm not interacting with people. Nobody's stopping my flow to get receipts. The boss isn't calling to pull me off one project into another project. Man, I just get to plan out my day and work the plan. There is something sweet about that. Oh, absolutely. That's exciting. And um, for you to get to build something, you're such a builder and an innovator. And it's like for the first time, it's like, what does Nick want to do? You know, solely, solely, not anybody else. It's all on you, which is scary, but also very liberating at the same time. And I don't know what exactly what all that's going to look like. I have a starting place. What's fascinating is, you know, 2020 and 2021 was the great resignation. A lot of people left the workforce, never came back. Early retirements, two income families where the one of the uh, one of the partners decided to stay home and just figure out how to do it on one income versus working two incomes and paying child care. You and I didn't have that option. You and I were, you know, frontline every day, couldn't leave our jobs, had to help people work through some stuff. And so to be here on this three years later saying, resign if you want to resign, um, was really wonderful. And I was supposed to do a big event in June downstate and um, just got canceled and one of the guys that was going to be a partner in this in this production we were going to do works with the Secretary of State in North Carolina. And there are a record number of people applying for LLCs and corporations that are starting their own businesses. And so we're seeing a lot of people that want to walk away from the eight to five and do their own thing. 
make a little less money, make a little more money, have a little less stress, have a little more stress, but at least it's on you and you get Mm -hmm. to dictate that. And so I'm just the latest in that trend that's making a big leap and a big move. And there are several trends which are really interesting about people my age making big leaps like that that I've learned about recently. But I think that I'm not the only one making a big move like this. But, man, it's exciting to leave the the pastorate. It's exciting to start a podcast, exciting to write a book. And now it's exciting to quit your job and start a brand new business. Hey, so many things. So many things. That's so cool. And I also applaud you for doing this, quote unquote, later in life. Um, You know, a lot of people, I think, I mean, I have friends in their early 30s who would be terrified to take these leaps, let alone 20 years down the road when we're, you know, 50 years old. And so I think that's incredible. And I applaud you for that. And I think, I think it's going to inspire a lot of other people because it's like, and I, and I hate to, I don't know, this could be taking kind of cheesy, but we really only have one life. We only have this time. So it's like, okay, I can keep being miserable for the next decade. Right. Or I can say, you know what? I'm going to roll the dice. And I think what a lot of people don't realize, and this is what I didn't even realize, I have a way bigger safety net than I know. Um, And I think, you know, yes, finances are terrifying. There's a lot of people who like financially just can't jump and do it. I totally understand that. There's a lot of people who may not have the support emotionally, relationally to do that. But I think if we really had a dream and we sat down and we mapped out what does that actually look like to practically do these things, there is more opportunity than we realize. And we are far more capable than we realize. Um, Because it was even like me when I I was ready to move. And I was like, yo, I could totally blow this thing. Like I could Mm -hmm. absolutely just fall on my face and this be the worst thing that I've ever done. And of course, I was in the mode where I was like thinking of every worst case scenario at the time. Right. Um, Because I dreamed and I got excited. And then as soon as I feel like sometimes we release a dream, then then all the little like extra noise is like, but what if you fail? Um, Right. And I remember I was in California with Adrian and we were visiting my brother and my sister-in-law and um, I got a phone call from Kristen Lee and she was like, oh, you should, you should go for it. Like you really should do it. Like, and you know what, Emily, if something happens and you have nowhere to live and you have no job, you can come sleep on my couch. You can come live with me and I'll make sure that, you know, we get you another job. We get you back on your feet. And this is just a friend of mine. And I was like, oh, yeah, there are people that like, if I blew it, I could go live on their couch, you know? I love that. I could work at McDonald's and I could sleep on their couch and I would start over from the ground up. But I needed, it was so funny. And I even know that my parents, again, incredible parents, they would have never let me be on the streets. But like. I don't know what it was about a random close friend just sharing, just saying like, hey, if this is totally the worst ever, I got you. Like, you can come stay with me until you get back I, on your feet. It was the most freeing thing. Oh, my gosh. And that's why I was like, well, heck, yeah. When's the fastest I can get out of here? <laughs> like, that was really it. It was one of those. And I don't think I've ever told Kristen that. So, Kristen, I know that you're listening. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I hope that we also give other people permission. Like those people that are really close to you and they're debating something. If you're like, listen, if all else fails, I got a floor you can come sleep on. You know what I'm (laughs) saying? Like, like it takes those little bitty things of knowing that you're not alone, even though when you know it, like consciously, okay, no, but like there's those little nagging voices in the back and yeah, that was one of the defining moments of me making wow. a decision. Yeah. That is so cool. That's a great story. You know, I think about my son when you tell me that story because every problem he has, he thinks about the solutions a person. If you told him, say, hey, you got a leak in your roof, he would be like, okay, who do I know that knows a roofer? 
Mm-hmm. And if you said, well, you got a problem with your well, he'd like, okay, I know I know I have a friend that knows somebody that could help with my well. And he's he's so high on his IQ, he's at EQ, that he's so connected with other relationships that he's like, I know somebody. I can sleep on their floor. I can sleep on their couch. It'll be okay. And I loved what Tyler said. You know, okay, back to making big leaps for a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Key, I'm talking about intentional big leaps, particularly careers. So Robert Kiyosaki wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm-hmm. And a classic book, wonderful book, excellent. And in the book, he talks about creating your side hustle. And that once you create a side hustle, when it when the income of your side hustle equals your job, you jump and you leave your job and now you have the same income and now you're doing the thing you love to do. So he's like, if you really love painting, start painting while you've got a day job. And if you're passionate about it, you'll be passionate, put in the extra hours, build an equal income. And I don't think it even has to be equal. It has to be substantial so you can go ahead and make your leap. But if you remember in our last podcast with Tyler, he talked about the fact that he had several side hustles. And when he left his day job at the police department and he came home, he picked up a job, picked up another job. And you just do whatever it takes. You got to do what it takes to do. And so for me, I decided, hey, I'm going to make this leap. I'm going to go ahead and quit my day job. I'm going to start this consulting business. And if I have to work two days a week at the grocery store, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm able to do that. I'm healthy. I'm not too proud to do that. Two days a week to put groceries on the table while I'm building something. It's not an all or nothing. It's, it's an all or nothing in a decision to take a risk. But there's all kinds of resources out there to help fund what we're already doing. And I think that most people, like I was talking to somebody this last week, and we were just talking about life, and they were talking about thinking about some changes with their career. They've been at the same place for over a decade. And I began to ask them questions about their upward mobility, about the vision that the owner had for their life. And they didn't have anything. I mean, nothing. And I just went ahead and took a risk, and I said, you're done. You're done there. And, and late at, recently, somebody shared with me a research um, poll that was done on millionaires that left their jobs late in their careers, then became millionaires. And they said, what was the number one factor? And there was like six factors. But the number one factor was they were not utilized to their potential. They felt like that they were only utilized 70% of their potential. Uh, sometimes they said that the culture around... The office was toxic. They felt like they were being used to further someone else's agenda, not their own agenda. And at some point, they just sat back and said, why am I spending my life for somebody else's benefit when they have no vision for me, no idea about what I could be in the future? And I'm going to have to leave this organization to get promoted because there's no promotion in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I find that a lot of people get stuck in routine and they hate change. Mm-hmm. And because of that, they stay and give away big chunks and pieces of their life that they should have left and they should have just bet on themselves and gone and done something else. So I figured I'd rather do that and work in a grocery store two days a week so that five days a week I get to try to be me and enjoy my life than to sit somewhere where I'm not fully me. And this is not to throw anybody on the bus. This is about me moving forward, yeah. not moving away from something else. But any thoughts or any ideas about what I just said? Yeah, immediately uh, I'm I'm just it's the ego and the pride. Like if people can lay that down just like you're doing and say like, "Hey, if I need to go make supplemental income doing something that um I don't want to say is beneath you by no stretch of the imagination, but something yeah. that would be stereotypically out of the norm from somebody coming from a high paying career job, uh, leadership positions, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, to go what we as a society think down to that is, I think monumental, like for us to not be so prideful that we would sacrifice our dream for a se- right. like for even a season like it may just be a temporary thing to get you through to the next level and so i think ego and pride keep a lot of people back um from doing yeah. that when they would have to make a sacrifice of some sort 
So, great example. Can you imagine me working at Chick-fil-A two days a week? If you rolled up and I stood next to your car and said, hey, what, what's the name on the order? And you're like, M. And I'm like, what would you like to order? And you're like, Nick, is that you working at Chick-fil-A two days a week? Yeah, babe, because the next five days I get to live my dream. Yeah, I'm willing to do that. How are you doing working on somebody else's dream <laughs> all week long and hating life? I, there's two things that made me think it's time to, to, to go. It's time to leave. Um, I left the pastorate. I remember Frank said something to me that was really powerful. When I came to him and said, I've been offered a job, he says, you should really consider it. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, you've been done for two years. And I said, really? And he said, the things that used to life you now drain you. All the stuff you used to do that you enjoyed doing, now they drain you. And that's a great sign it's time to leave. If you've been on your job five years or more and you used to enjoy what you're doing, but now it sucks the life out of you, it's time to go. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I hadn't been on my job five years, been on my job two years, but the emotional toll on not being what I needed to be and, and people not even having a clue who I was, not recognizing who I was and therefore not opening opportunities, it was like, I've got to go. I've, yeah. I've got to go. I cannot be me here. I just can't be me. And, and there were reasons why I couldn't be me. It wasn't like somebody was trying to restrict me. Like I said, I have nothing evil or bad to say about my last employer. I was not me. I had been there long enough to adjust to the mm -hmm. culture. Now I needed to start being myself, exercise leadership, uh, speaking into things, challenging things. And there wasn't room. And it was like, okay, to be me, I have to leave. It's not their fault. I have to leave. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people out there, because they don't have something to go to, yeah, they just bottle that up and push that down and say, just get over it, be more mature, suck it up, get through this, mm -hmm. um, you know, suck it up, buttercup. And it's like, no, that's half of the feeling of leaving is understanding that I'm not happy now and I'm never going to be happy if I stay here. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. Dang. And I just wish more people would just, man, what do you want out of life? I mean, yeah, yeah it's cliche. We only get one life, but we only get one life. But that is and fact. <laughs> it's a fact. And I would rather a year from now be taking a lesser job, mm -hmm. having bet on myself, and then figuring out that what I jumped for was not realistic and I needed to adjust. That's the whole thing. Uh, you know, Somebody told me, he said, Nick, you're not going to find me your sweet spot for five years. And that really bothered me because I'm not very patient. Mm -hmm. And they're like, have you ever had the freedom to roll the dice for yourself? And I'm like, no. They said, there's some things you haven't learned then. You've carried all this other responsibility. But man, why is it so bad if we start to try something? It doesn't work and we have to adjust. We have to adjust. We have to adjust. And finally... We find our sweet spot for the next decade. And so for me, it's like, I'm going to roll the dice, going to see what I can do. And I just think we, we need more people taking big risks, not less people. Yes. And it will surprise you what good will come from the risk. Um, when I started looking for other jobs when I left North Carolina, um, I was like, okay, I would... If I can just make a little bit more than I was making because I was living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and I remember getting a job offer and it was, first of all, it was way more money and it was between a price range. Like it was the like a low end salary and a high end. And I was like, whoa, the low end. Wow. And I remember they called me back for the offer and they were like, okay, we want to give you the top end. Um, we're giving you this offer. Here's everything else that comes with this. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I could have fallen out on the floor. And it was just so funny because I didn't even give myself the worthiness yeah. of more. I was like, if I could just make a little bit more and then like, no, you're worth so much more. And there's a lot of people who work jobs with salary caps or like, that's all they make an hour. And that's that yeah. you are worth more. You are worth more. So go out there and get it because it is out there. And I just encourage people like, 
go get the goodness of following your heart and following your dreams and really pursuing what God has for you that is so much more grand than you can dream up or imagine. Hallelujah. And I, and I, I got an amen and out I know what y'all in the same thinking. podcast. Lord, help us, Jesus. So yes. one of the things I think very important is I believe, and, I, and I, I'm not poking at any of our non-religious folks, but intelligent design, I was created for a purpose. Mm-hmm. I mean, I believe that. Uh, there are things I'm good at. There's things I'm not good at. And my job in this life is to discover why I was created, where my strengths are, mm-hmm. and not just so I can make a maximum contribution to everybody else, but so I can enjoy my life. Yeah. So I can be led by joy. You want to be led by peace. I want to be led by joy. Mm-hmm. Well, joy is living congruent with your strengths mm-hmm. and not your weaknesses. And so I think so many people miss out. They get to nine to five. They get a paycheck. They learn how to live on a budget or they live on a standard of living. But, but, Man, when do we live? When do you get to? Ch- and if you're only living on vacation two weeks a year, you're not really living. And so my hope is in doing this, I have no, I can't fail. You say, well, you can't pay your bills. Well, then I'll get a part time job, but I haven't fail. I'm I'm pursuing my mm-hmm. best for my life, and at this point, that's working for myself, not for somebody else. Yeah, and one thing I was going to ask you is if you. Are you scared of failing? But you just kind of answered. You were like, you know what? I'm going to do what it takes to make this life beautiful and good. And I know I'm going to have to do some hard work or make some sacrifices, but you're going to do it. Yep. I, I, I was talking to somebody today and they're like, how you feel? And I said, amazing. And so I said, I have 10% anxiety, not fear. Mm-hmm. 10% anxiety about when am I getting paid? How am I getting paid? How am I going to add value? Where am I going to find customers? And all those kind of things. I mean, those are normal things when starting a business and they're all wrapped up in one. But at the same time, to get up this morning, whenever I woke up, which was earlier than normal, just because I was excited to go to the gym and say, I can do this every day. I can go to the gym every single day. To call and check on some people I care about, to schedule some appointments, to move some things around, to make some proposals was just life giving to me. And I'm like, yep, I don't mind working 12 hours a day doing those things I love to do, um, but I don't like working eight hours a day for things that do not bring me life. And I'm hoping that somebody out there will say, you know, as I look at my career with the company I'm with, there's no way I'm going anywhere anytime soon. Get off the boat. Go find something else. I hate to say it, but many times you have to leave the organization you're in to get promoted. Uh, absolutely. Amen. <laughs> that is so true. Like, uh, so If you're so hanging true. out at your employer hoping they're going to finally give you more money when they don't have to. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know people that are in a holding place for 10 years. Their boss is just happy you're holding down that job for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you might have to leave to go to another organization to get the promotion you've been dreaming of. And then your old company might call you back to hire you for a higher position because they want you back now. But if you're content to sit at a lower position, what makes you think they would pay you more to do something else? They're going to do the lowest thing they have to do to keep you where you are and keep you happy. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's the other thing being somewhere and this, even outside of work, you need to go where people value you. That is in your friendships, your family work, like go where you are valued because you do have a unique contribution. You do have something to say, you have something to give, and you need to be around people who value you all the time. At so one of the most, most painful quotes I've ever had somebody say to me in my lifetime, and I say it all the time, Rocky Russell quoted this to me and he said, you deserve what you will tolerate. Mm-hmm. And I just can't get over that. Do not ask anybody to give you something when you're not willing to demand it for yourself. Mm-hmm. I just won't tolerate, com- you know, the common 
I'm not going to tolerate average. And at the end of the day, I'd rather go down in flames reaching for the best life I could have than tolerating mediocre and holding on until I can retire. So I think more people need to make big moves. I think sometimes the feathers get pulled out of the nest to make you uncomfortable. And sometimes you have a dream in front of you. And sometimes you have a friend that says, let me, just, you can sleep on my couch if you crash and burn. And, and listen, you're never going to get a hundred percent. If you can get 75, rip their arm off, go <laughs> make your, make your move, make your move. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Nick. I appreciate always your transparency, vulnerability, and willingness to just share it all with us. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Alrighty, friends, you know what to do. Make sure you follow, like, subscribe. And if you're wondering how to do that, well, look no further than the description and we can hook you up with wherever you need to go. Follow both of us or follow our our combined pages here on the podcast platforms um, so we can interact with you. We love to hear from you. Don't forget to slide into those DMs, comment, message away, email us, all the wonderful things. Um, We thank you for joining us once again. Shout out real quick to this incredible music by Caleb Honorkamp. The Photography You See Us In by Allison Frost of Before the Foundation's Photography and our faithful and loyal producer, Adrian Vosch. We can't wait to see you next time. I feel like I'm a 1970s program talker here now that I've got these cool beats going. (laughs) But yes, you guys have a fantastic day and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.